This is Changemakers with Katie Gore, finding the right solutions for the affordable housing community. Welcome back to my conversation with Janet Abrahams, the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Housing Authority of Baltimore City. We've been talking about her 20-year career in affordable housing and the work she's done since taking over the reins in Baltimore five years ago. Now, Janet, you're an MTW agency, and for folks not familiar with that, can you explain what MTW is and how that's helping you succeed in Baltimore? Oh, definitely. So MTW means move into work, and this is where um, housing authority that's part of this particular um, group have the ability to block grant their fundings. And so that allows housing authority with the MTW status to take all the funding that we get, which is not something that a regular housing authority can do, but take all the funding that we receive to address the needs of the organization. But at the same time, um, having the MTW status also allows us to take a look at some of the regulations that are too strict or it does not allow for our families to prosper. And so we can suggest a change to that particular regulation and implement it after being approved. And then, of course, what HUD does, they look at all the different um, changes that we have made and they either choose to adopt or not. So one of the things, because of the MTW cohort, we were able to introduce different ways of um, doing things with our families. For example, you have some areas that have a higher rent, a higher um, contract rent, because that area can afford to do that. And they had to, of course, get it approved. And so you have new cohorts now that have joined this particular MTW family, and they're implementing different rent um, structures in their communities to see how that will work for the families. So basically, overall, what the program does is really help to better the families and it help us to understand our families and see what works and what doesn't. But at the same time, with the block granting, it helps us to address their needs um, um, quickly, but it also helps us to move a lot of our um, properties that are obsolete to a different financial platform. Because HABC or any other MTW agency will now have not only the land, because that's what um, we have that power, because we come with the land, but we can also help to fill some gaps with our um, block granting ability. I'm sure it's also letting your families go to areas that are in market demand, but also represent areas of opportunity and maybe even attract and retain other landlords. Is that correct as well? Exactly. I mean, so moving families, it allows us to take the, um, instead of the 110% of the fair market rent, we, uh, we have the ability to go up to 120%, which helps us in areas of opportunity. So we're able to negotiate with landlords because we have that ability Um, to do that. And it allowed us also to implement landlord incentives. So we're able to, which we are implementing now, was we are able to give landlord sign-on bonuses. We're able, we have um, established a pot of funds for tenant damages, because that's that was also a big deal with landlords. You know, when a tenant moves out, sometimes they don't have the funding to, to rehab those units because they're in such bad condition. And so mm-hmm. now we have the ability to help them with the getting the units back online and also give them an incentive if that unit, if they allow that unit to stay in the Section 8 program. That's the only way we can get these landlords to really understand how serious this is and that we really want our families in decent, safe, and sanitary housing. I'm glad that you circled back to the earlier comment you had talked about with landlords and now, you know, Ed told us of what you're doing with the bonuses for, you know, new property owners or to retain these landlords. What's the feedback that you're getting within that community? So interestingly enough, we just had our MTW community meeting. So we have to have the public hearing 
on um, any one of the changes that we're making. And one of the, um, the co comments that we received at the hearing was that how happy they were that HABC is adopting these new changes for landlords. So I thought that was really good. And it, it really showed that we're on the right track. You mentioned after having such a rough go round during COVID and what happened, if you were going to predict how much more is needed to recruit landlords for your area, what would you summarize that to look like? Is it more of the same flexibility with rents or is it more sign on bonuses or is there something else that your landlords need to be able to come in confidently within your programs? What we implemented this time around was as a result of having those meetings with landlords and understanding what they need. So until we are able to assess how successful this is, I won't be able to say what else do they need. I do know that there are some streamlining that we need to do to our program, because as you know, there's still that level of bureaucracy that exists where you still have to collect so much data. And we just went um, virtual. So we have a landlord portal um, that the landlords are happy. Now they can get all their results on this portal. They don't have to go into the office. They can, you know, upload information. So we're really looking now, once we um, implemented these incentives, to see what else do we need to tweak? Because we have been tweaking the program since I arrived here in Baltimore. You know, I just did a random search here that says um, the average rents for Baltimore City, and they're really all over the place, depending on what the neighborhood is, but it's everything from $1,000 up to $2,800. That's a big swing for landlords to navigate in the market and to be able to afford what they've got to do for property improvements and try to meet the needs of the program. So I'm sure that you guys are navigating these market swings closely. And is there a landlord group that you guys work with, you know, a real estate group? You know, how do you guys stay connected to landlords? So we have, um, of course, the, the meetings with the landlords where we, you know, talk with them about different programs. We also use... Um, for our most vulnerable clientele, we have um, home finders that works with with that group, um, case managers, and their job is to make sure that they keep a close eye, which we do keep a very close eye on the, the changes, the market changes in the city and the rents are going up. And for example, you know, you the areas with the 2800 for one bedroom, you have those areas, those are areas of opportunity. And so those are the areas that we are really banging on doors with landlords to say, let us in, because it's very mm -hmm. difficult for them to let us in simply because they're, they're, they're used to the market rate. And also here in Baltimore, we just adopted, well, in Maryland, the income discrimination against the type of income. But, you know, landlords still find a way. We're still working with that particular market. We have a few families in areas of opportunities and we were able to negotiate the rent. But some of these rents are so high that we can't pay them. Even with our higher percentage of fair market, we still are priced out of those communities. You know, I'm not sure when the funders make the allocation of what you guys are eligible for. I'm not sure if they realize all of the different doors you have to knock on, all the partnerships you have to make, in addition to all the compliance pieces. And oh, by the way, making sure all the redevelopment is in a location with the amenities. Um, the funding just doesn't seem to be able to cover all of these unique dynamics, which in the beginning, I feel like affordable housing was just property management, paint the unit, mow the grass, do the basic for property management. But with what you've described, it's a whole nother affordable housing continuum that has to occur, which the funding just isn't there to try to do all the things. And so speak to how you guys are so effective with what you're doing. I mean, is it your partners? Is it your staff? Is it D, all of the above? <laughs> it is all of the above. 
And I have to say, you have to have good relationships with the state, with the city, and your staff have to be able to know what doors to knock on. So here in Baltimore, of course, um, we have our 9% tax credit allocation that has really helped because everyone realized when you get the 9%, years ago, you didn't have a gap with the 9%. But now with the um, issues that we're having with the supply chain and we're having also having issues with labor and what have you, we've seen an increase of 35 to 40% increase in construction costs. And so that has created some, some of the gaps that we're facing, but we're still working through with the city We're working through our funding, uh, making sure, see if we can um, pull down some of our reserves and also working with um, the state. And that's why we have been able to close down Somerset phase one, two, and three. Those are currently, phase one is um, completely occupied and phase two and three, they're under. And those are all, some of them are twinning deals, 9%, 4%. So we had to, we were one of the first in the state of Maryland to um, do a twinning deal where we took the 9% tax credits and the four and put them together. That was another way, uh, being creative of of how you close these deals, working with these um, private funders, working with some of the foundations, to um, close some of these gaps. So it takes so much to really bring together everyone to get the deals closed. And the staff, that's their job. They're supposed to, they work with the developers. They make sure that we're all on track. So it's all of the above. Everybody must come. It's a village. Honestly, it's a village in order for us to make these um, deals work. And, And we've been successful because we have really worked hard to make sure the message is clear. We get the message out being being extremely transparent to say, at the end of the day, this is what can happen here in this area. And this is how much investment Baltimore can get if we are able to really close on these deals. Speaking of new funding awards, tell us about Enterprise Community Partners recently awarding you funding for wellness programs. What is that going to look like for your older adults? And tell us about that exciting news. So we have a really great SVP um, of uh, resident services. Her her name is um, Tracy Kaiser Oliver. And Tracy, she runs a very well oil machine in the resident services area. So, of course, they go after grant. They have their grant writers. They make sure that um, they are bringing in all the different services that our families need. And they have their pulse on the need of the families. And they do that from door knocking to surveys to all the different things that they uh, have um, implemented pop-ups because they are always interfacing with our residents. So this grant will help us to um, provide the services that our seniors need. Um, Seniors are a very vulnerable population. A lot of them are empty nesters, and they require more services than our regular folks that's, you know, trying to get to work and that kind of thing. So, you know, they some of them may need a living aid. Some of them may need. So it will help us to make the assessment and be able to provide the necessary services for those families. Some of these seniors have no families. And so we're their family. We're the ones that's there giving them presents at, uh, at Christmas time, making sure that they have food for Thanksgiving. So it will allow us to do all those things that the families will otherwise will never be able to take advantage of. So last question here, and you may have just answered it actually, but let me give you a chance to maybe add another one. What is the most enjoyable part of your job? Wow. Um, I love dealing with um, the families. I love my staff. Wow. They make me look good every single day. The things that they have to go through in some of these properties just to have a full day of work is amazing. They're my heroes with some of the things that I have seen. Let's be frank. Some, some of them dodge bullets just to get back to their office. The fact that they come back the next day 
And, and it's not, a lot of them, this is not a job for them. This is a, something that they enjoy doing. And they come in and they hit the ground running every day. So I enjoy that portion of it where I am connecting with them and making sure we're communicating with them. Um, I have a great communications department. They are magnificent when it comes to reaching out and touching our families, including the residents. I enjoy my, my residents. You know, there are times when they I'll go to meeting and, and they'll yell and scream at me and I understand. It's okay. We're going to make this better because when I come back, I promise you, I always say that to them. I'll take it today. But when I come mm -hmm. back, I promise you, you're going to be happy to see me. And it never fails. The thank yous that you get. I remember when I was um, in my social work class in college, I remember my professor said one out of the hundreds that you touch will say thank you. But you know what? Back in the day, that was true. But I'm seeing more now seeing more from our staff and from our residents, the thank yous, because you know you're doing something good. And that's, that's what I enjoy more than anything else is that touch and, and making sure at the end of the day, I can see the smile on their faces when they walk into those new apartments and um, are able to look at a unit with their own washer and dryer, air conditioning, you know, little things that we take for granted. And they're able to go in with granite countertops, stainless steel appliances. And just to see the look on their faces, it's amazing. It sounds like you have a bunch of leaders who really understand their mission and are driven by those experiences. And that's the secret for how you guys are doing a great job in Baltimore. Yes, definitely. Uh, you know, and we have a great team. The team understands four C's you know, which is customer service, communication, collaboration, and community. They understand that. And that's what we want, right? As, an, as a housing authority, we want to be able to collaborate, not just with ourselves, but with the residents, with our stakeholders. We want, want to be able to have clear and concise communications. So to let people be transparent, let people know what we're doing. And of course, customer service. We have got to have great customer service if you intend to do well in this industry. And then, of course, collaboration. So it's, it's, it's awesome. Even though this is not what I wanted to, to do, I wanted to always be second in command, I can honestly say I'm enjoying this. Well, Destiny decided differently, so we are <laughs> glad you're there. And I also know that many of our listeners are going to hear everything that you guys are doing, from redevelopment to customer engagement and going out and seeking additional funds and that they're going to be inspired. So the ripple effect of your leadership is going to be even more magnified outside of the city of Baltimore. And, you know, nationally, you're recently added to the Council of Large Public Housing Authority. So you've had a microphone for a long time. And uh, your again, your impact is going throughout many, many other areas other than just Baltimore. And we're, we're better for it because it's going to let lots of other people hear and see and then be encouraged by that as well. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Well, Janet, it has been fantastic to have you on the podcast and we will stay connected. And I thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me. Thanks for listening to Changemakers with Katie Gore. To find out more about Katie, go to quadel.com. That's Q-U-A-D-E-L.com. This has been a production of Forbes Books Radio.